to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. An official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. In recent months, in the press, over the radio, and also here on television, you have heard of the new and awesome developments in warfare which put modern muscle into your army. Such muscle is the 280 millimeter cannon, the Honest John artillery rocket, and the Corporal long range guided missile. Such modern muscle is tactical television and air delivery of masses of men and their equipment. But what if we were really attacked by an aggressor force? How would these weapons be employed on the battlefield? The big picture takes you to a desert area in North Carolina for the answer. Aggressor forces have landed. Heavily reinforced and equipped with the latest weapons, their scheme calls for conquest of the whole United States. Now with a foothold well established on American soil, they prepare to press the attack. The order to advance is given. It passes down the line to the local commanders. Aggressor troops move out over the North Carolina countryside. There is casual confidence in the ranks. Theirs was a sneak attack, and so far they have met with success. The aggressor is well equipped. Last-minute preparations before H hour. Communications are established and weapons and equipment checked. Infantry take up their positions. A sniper moves up. A forward observer surveys the front. More infantry board armored carriers. Automatic weapons are brought up to cover the infantry. Bayonets are fixed and then... the attack. presses forward. Local resistance is crushed. It is the Blitzkrieg, the lightning war. American outpost observed the aggressor main body. Pitifully outnumbered, United States units have been pulling back in an orderly withdrawal. Still, they have maintained contact with the enemy, and now they observe his movements. Position, strength, and battle order of the aggressor forces are reported and relayed back to higher headquarters.
other observers' reports filled her in, too. Aggressive forces have invaded road junction 804. Prepare to move out. From this information, their plan evolves. And at an air base somewhere deep inside America, power troopers of the veteran 82nd Airborne Division prepare to take off. These are the Minutemen of tomorrow. Their mission, to establish an airhead directly in the path of the aggressor onslaught, to knock him off balance, hold him up until the American main body can be brought into the battle. All set, prepare to take off. The first phase of exercise flash burn gets underway. You have just seen a brief picture of what could be a reality in these United States. An invasion by an aggressive force. The purpose of this film is to bring you a report as to what your army is doing to meet with such an emergency. This is one element designed to meet with such an action. This is a maneuver, a maneuver of the most realistic proportions and the most advanced ever staged within the concepts of modern warfare. The sky is full of men, thousands of fighting men, a whole division. Modern Minutemen and their battle equipment float down from the heavens to the ground beneath. The airdrop is a success. The division has landed without incident. Once on the ground, the power trooper turns fighting infantryman. He moves off the exposed drop zone and seeks the nearest cover and concealment. A defense perimeter must be established, for somewhere in the woods out front, the aggressor army rolls forward. But exercise flash burn is only a maneuver designed to train your army in the use of new atomic weapons. To explain what exercise flash burn means, here is Lieutenant General A.R. Bowling, the maneuver director. 60,000 Army personnel are going to be employed in this large atomic defensive maneuver, which has been named Exercise Flashburn. It will include many new concepts and weapons of tactical warfare, proposed changes in the organization of the infantry regiment to make it a stronger and more effective fighting force will be tested during this exercise. It will also provide the latest step in testing our newest weapons. This is the first time the 280 millimeter cannon with atomic capability has been employed in an Army field exercise. It is also the first time that the Honest John, the new heavy field artillery rocket and the guided missile called Corporal, both capable of carrying atomic and high explosive warheads, have appeared in such a maneuver. We consider this the most important military exercise ever staged because it employs troops that have been trained extensively in the use of atomic weapons for the first time under combat conditions. In addition, vast numbers of troops are being employed by air utilizing the latest models of equipment once used on the battlefields in World War II and Korea. We have made this exercise as close to reality as strictest safety rate precautions would allow. Along with the Army, the Air Force is running a maneuver in conjunction with ours called TAC Air 54-7. 
while the Army is receiving invaluable training in the defense against enemy air attacks, tactical use of atomic weapons, land of mine warfare, and defense against chemical, biological, and radiological warfare, the Air Force will be testing and training tactical units in all phases of field operation. We intend to simulate many things throughout this exercise, such as atomic bomb explosions, but we are certain that those soldiers participating will get profitable training and that many of the defensive and offensive movements will provide the best methods to be used in modern warfare. Now, although we have advanced atomic weapons, I must emphasize that the ground soldier cannot be replaced. There is no substitute for him in gaining and in holding ground. To see what's going on to meet the aggressor threat, the big picture camera moves into the field. Here's an atomic weapon that's making its first appearance in a combat tactical maneuver. Sergeant, what is your position with the crew here? I'm the chief of a corporal launching section, sir. Now, you must have quite some specialized training, and your men, too. Yes, sir, we have uh, quite extensive schools of, of approximately two years at the Artillery and Guided Missile Center at Fort Bliss, Texas. Sir. In Texas? Yes, sir. Now, how far can you send out this weapon? This uh, corporal surface-to-surface -surface guided missile has can hit targets at ranges greater than 50 miles, sir. Now, do weather conditions affect your firing at all? No, sir, weather condition or visibility does not affect us whatsoever. Now, what about the mobility of this large weapon here? Well, sir, this machine that you see here, we, with this machine, we can set our missile in approximately any position that we want it, and this machine will turn around almost on a dime, sir. Turn on a dime? Yes, sir. Well, that's very interesting. Now, this is the first time that you've uh, had the corporal in a uh, maneuver such as this, isn't it? Yes, sir. And uh, you're now preparing it for a simulated fire. Yes, sir, we are. And I know you want to get into action. We enjoyed talking with you. Thank you very much. Well, good sir. luck to you, too. Leaving the corporal guided missile, we took a look at Honest John. The crew chief was just getting ready for action. He told us that Honest John was a surface-to-surface -surface missile, and although there was no guidance of the rocket once aimed and fired, Still, it was capable of accurately hitting the target some 18 miles away. And like the corporal, it could be armed with either a high explosive or a fragmentation warhead. Also, if there was a target important enough, it could carry an atomic charge. Then I noticed that the crew had removed some sort of a covering from the nose of the missile. I asked the lieutenant about it. He informed us that it was an electric blanket and that its purpose was to keep the powder cap at a constant temperature to ensure proper detonation. Then he went on to explain how this whole complex rig was truck mounted to ensure 100% battlefield mobility. This was the first time the rocket had been employed in maneuver of these proportions. And this was only a prototype. Bigger and better rockets are on their way. We took leave of Honest John and his crew to observe another big gun in preparation. This is a 280 millimeter gun. Sergeant, has the 280 been employed in a tactical maneuver before? Uh, no, sir, it hasn't. Now, what type of shells or rounds do you fire out of the 280? Uh, we fire two different types of rounds. We fire regular artillery rounds. Also, we're capable of firing atomic rounds. An atomic round? That's right. And what would be the range of that atomic round? Uh, approximately 20 miles. And that's an unguided flight? That is unguided. I see. Now, how easy is it to move this huge weapon? It looks awfully large to me. Now, sir, it's uh, very easy to move this weapon around. Be surprised, actually, how easy it is to move. Well, that's, that's quite amazing. Now, you are the section chief, is that's that correct? Right, section chief. Now, you could probably tell us, in your own words, uh, how do you feel about this weapon? Well, as long as I've been in the Army, I've been in artillery, and been in quite a few of them, and I wouldn't say this for any of them. Well, that's quite a note of recommendation. Thank you very much for talking with us. Good. Thank you. Here's another specialized soldier. Yes, he's a tactical television cameraman. Private, how does this camera compare to the television camera we see in the studio? This camera is a much smaller industrial version, having only about three tubes, sir. 
What do you have to do to operate this tactical television camera? I just pointed out the scene I wish you uh, take, sir. Well, what about focusing? As you can see it now, it's done remotely from another, uh, by another operator. Back at the monitor? That's correct, sir. Well, now, how far can you transmit to the command post this action that's going on here at the front? We can transmit this by radio a maximum of 25 miles with our equipment. And the officers in command can get that 25 miles from here? That's correct, sir. Now, this is the first time that tactical television has appeared in a maneuver, am I correct? That's right. And it's been well accepted, I understand, also. We've had very good results with it in this maneuver. What do you think of tactical television as future yourself? It has a great future because it can provide the information accurately and instantaneously to the command. Well, thank you very much. You better get back to televising now. It's very interesting. Somewhere out front is the aggressor enemy. Where and how many? The board outpost can tell, but the general wants to know. It's important. That is the story of tactical television. From the cameraman observer, the picture goes back by cable to this control point, mounted in a three-quarter ton truck. Here, the picture is monitored, and a constant control kept over picture brilliance, clarity, and definition. Focus and diaphragm settings of the camera lens are remotely controlled. All the cameraman need do is aim the camera at his subject. Everything else is done here at the control point. From the control point, the picture is carried by cable to the microwave relay antenna, where it is beamed 10 or 20 miles to another antenna, which receives the picture. From here, a cable carries it to a conventional television set. Here, at a regimental command post, a photo interpreter helps the intelligence officer to evaluate the televised picture. For a more general idea of the enemy situation, tactical television takes to the air. A light plane flies over aggressor-held territory. It's a conventional-looking aircraft, but inside is a miniature television station. Behind the pilot is the television cameraman. Through the electronic viewfinder, he monitors the picture the camera is taking. He controls camera movement with his left hand as he keeps watch through the viewfinder. Again, the picture is sent back by microwave relay, and back at headquarters, it can be viewed by the whole staff if need be. The general now has the eyes of the outpost through the new technique of tactical television. Yes, TV in the Army has great potentialities. This is Lieutenant Robert Scott, who's commanding officer of the Interim Tactical Television Unit. As the first officer to put television into a tactical situation, a maneuver, what are some of the problems you came about, and also what do you think the future is of tactical television? Well, all of the officers and commanders that use television in this maneuver were very impressed with his capabilities in a tactical situation. And they all expressed their desire to use television in future ap tactical applications. However, this equipment that we use in the maneuver is too large for proper cover and concealment. And the transmission uh, equipment that we use to get a picture back into the rear areas is too limited for tactical situations. However, we definitely proved that a television picture is of value for the commander to obtain intelligence information, troop control, and many other applications so that we can now go ahead and develop equipment that is smaller, more rugged uh, equipment and can follow the soldier right into the forward areas. That's, but you really have benefited, uh, Lieutenant, by this experience here at the maneuver. Definitely. We have proved beyond the question of a doubt that the television picture is of value to a infantry commander. Well, it's easily understood why it could be. Thank you very much for talking with us. Thank you. From the information obtained by tactical television and conventional methods, a clear picture of the enemy situation has developed. A plan of action is formulated. Though surrounded, the airhead has held. Now the United States Third Army must attempt to make a link up with that airhead.
back of the front, the huge Corporal guided missile rumbles into firing position. This is the long right arm of the new army, and it can deliver its Sunday punch over 50 miles to the very heart of the aggressor forces. With this simple control panel, it's a one-man operation. Just a twist of the finger, and the corporal raises its ponderous bulk into firing position. Slowly, with the steady assurance of the sunrise, it climbs into the sky. Under electronic guidance throughout its entire flight, its accuracy is unexcelled. Through densest fog or darkest night, it can strike without warning. But corporal is only the beginning. Soon there will be others more deadly even than this. As it stands ready, it lends the look of tomorrow to the army of today. But other weapons are getting ready too. From its concealed position, the 280 millimeter cannon springs into life. Camouflage nets are removed as the crew prepares for action. Known affectionately as the Mobile Monster, it is capable of placing an atomic shell accurately on the enemy 20 miles away. A powerful hydraulic system can swing the big barrel around with the ease of a pea shooter. But in exercise flash burn, the alternate manual system was employed to test its effectiveness too. Teamwork brings the massive muscle up on the target. All set, ready for fire. At another firing site, in another part of the battle area, troops rush out to prepare Honest John. An unguided missile, it is aimed like an artillery piece. Yet one round from Honest John packs the wallop of many hundreds of conventional artillery rounds. With last minute checks accomplished and safety pins pulled, Honest John lifts into firing position. Now at last, all is in order, and we are ready for the climax of exercise flash burn, atomic counterattack. A mock mushroom cloud rises high in the sky as simulated atomic explosions add realism to the maneuver. Shocked, after the brute force of an atomic barrage, the aggressor forces are confused. American armor rolls forward to take the initiative. Aggressors attempt to reorganize to meet the American attack. Surviving infantry positions are reinforced with armor. Our own infantry moves up. The stunned aggressor waits. Our armor opens the attack. In the following tank engagement, the American armor punches through, rumbles across the aggressor positions and into his rear areas. To exploit the armored breakthrough, more infantry units are moved up 
not to the front as in conventional warfare, but rather to a helicopter base. Here, squad after squad, they board the whirlybirds. And the whole combat team takes off. In this new type of airborne assault, distance, terrain, and enemy fortifications present no obstacles as the helicopters hop over the front lines to deliver the men where they are needed most. Through smoke and fire, they charge the aggressor positions and root them from the American soil. The tanker's success is turned into a ringing American victory. With the main battle over, mopping up begins and prisoners are taken. The aggressor attack is a failure. Exercise Flashburn has been a success, for not only was the aggressor defeated, but new weapons and techniques were tested under combat conditions. At the debriefing session, we were able to talk it over, and we all agreed America's new atomic capabilities were plenty effective and a great deterrent to aggression anywhere. The aggressor is destroyed, and once again, peace returns to the Carolina countryside. Exercise Flashburn has been a complete success. Under the most realistic battle conditions, your army has tested its new weapons and found them effective. Modern muscle has been added to the forces of freedom. This is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to be with us again when we will bring you another story in The Big Picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.